Dear Heavenly Father, just ask that you be with us here this morning as we're gathered here on this Sabbath morning to, to worship you. I just ask that you would be with us now as we open up your word once again, as we look at these two witnesses that are listed inside Revelation chapter 11. We need your guidance. So again, so we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide me as I present and be with each person here so that we can see this more clearly. Be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so the two witnesses are found in Revelation chapter 11, and I want to read these first three verses, and I want you to notice some really important things that are here. So it starts out and says, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Arise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles." And they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. If you don't remember, throughout this series, we've been doing word studies, and we'll be talking about this very thing here, 42 months, 1,260 days, three and a half years. So already right there in this passage, for those out there that are talking about some sort of future two witnesses that are going to come on the stage, right here in the very first three verses of this chapter, it tells you that these two witnesses originate where? 42 months, three and a half years, 1260 days. So this is really important that we recognize, again, that it's not some future thing that we're looking at, but it's something that's already transpired in the past. Because you remember the 42 months, the 1260 days, and the three and a half years applied to the period of papal supremacy. You probably remember where, again, they came up in 538 and had their power until 1798. So this is where it's located in the past. And when we go back to this period between 538 and 1798, that's when we had what was called the Dark Ages. And we had men like John Wycliffe and William Tyndale and and John Knox and Martin Luther and John Calvin and Swingley, all these guys that were fighting against what the papacy was doing, right? They were casting truth down to the ground. And these guys were, through the Reformation, were trying to strengthen the truth from God's Word, and the Word of God was being extended during this time. And you recognize earlier on in our series, we said that every time there's an escalation in the gospel, that there's an escalation with darkness. And so there we see right there during that dark ages that it's attacking against the people of God. And when we did the seven churches, we applied that period between the third, fourth, and fifth churches. The third church was the church of Pergamos, the fourth church was the church of Thyatira, and the fifth church was the church of Sardis. And we saw Pergamos and Thyatira as that dark ages where the papacy was doing its most control, but we saw that the Protestant reformers were trying to restore the church back to its original, and they were having all sorts of opposition during these three times. And you remember from Daniel chapter 2, this is the very thing that happened as Satan is working through the church to create this papal supremacy, right? It was the Satan that gave it its power, its authority, and its seat for those 1260 years. So it's so important you recognize this. This is actually something applied to the past and not something that we're looking forward to the future. Look at what it says in Revelation chapter 12. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman. What did you tell me that the woman represents? (coughs) That's correct. That's the church. Clothed in the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon. Who does that represent? Yes, that is Satan. Having seven heads and torn horns, seven diadems on his head. And the woman, the church, ends up fleeing into the wilderness where she is a place prepared by God. This is important. We recognize that of itself, it doesn't have the ability to protect itself. It is God that protects it, that he, should be fed, that he will feed them there for those 1,260 days. So you can see automatically a connection between the woman, the church, and those that are being there in the wilderness. 
which is the same place of which the two witnesses are. So we're going to see a connection between the church and these two witnesses, again, during this 1260-year period. So let's just start going through this. Let's start here in these first few verses. And again, we identify that it says, my two witnesses that are during this time. And the question you ask yourself is, where are the two witnesses in time? We did it. It's very simple. Those two witnesses are during that 1260-year period. When we go to Daniel chapter 7 and we see the lion, right? The bear and the leopard. And then we go to Daniel 8 with the ram and the goat. It literally names them, doesn't it? It says, this ram is Persia. This goat is Greece. It mentions them by name. So that means that no one can take any of these animals and reapply them somewhere else. Where people today, if you go on YouTube and watch this stuff, they're, they're reinterpreting the bear to become Russia. You can say, no, that doesn't work because we've already established Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8 already places them there. So you can do the same thing in Revelation 8. If someone tries telling you the two witnesses represent some future humans that are going to come on the stage or resurrected, you can say, whoops, wait a second. Look where this places it. It places it during the 1260 years. And we saw that many through the rapture are trying to reinterpret the 1260 days, the 42 months, and the three and a half years, and apply that to the seven-year rapture. Or the mid-trib, which is three and a half. Do you see what's happening? So they're reinterpreting these things and applying them into the future. And as I showed you last night and the night before, that came from the Catholic Church. During the Counter-Reformation, they came up with what was called futurism, which is putting all this stuff into the future. But we've already seen this is not future, this is past. It's already been here. So let's look at this. Verse 4. These two witnesses are two olive trees, and two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from the mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of the prophecy. And they have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. So who are these two witnesses that are also called two olive trees and also called two lampstands? If you go again to Revelation chapter 7, it says, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God. Did you see what it just did there? It said the servants of God are trees. Revelation 8, 7, And a third of the trees are were burned up. We recognize, do the people of God die in tribulation and hardship? Absolutely they do. Verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 4, they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the what? The seal of God. So trees that we see here are being connected with the people of God that he wants to seal. Okay, let's keep going. Revelation 1, verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the seven angels, right, of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are what? Seven churches. So lampstands and trees are being used to describe God's people, and here it is, what? God's people in the church. So when we go back to the 1260-year period, even though the papacy is, is persecuting the saints, are the saints still standing their ground? Are they still God's special people? Yes, this is really important you recognize this, okay? All right, let's keep going. Also in verse 5 to 7, and if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from... Now, this is where, again, you're going to miss the translation in the Greek. Here it says, their mouth their prophecy, their testimony. The reason why the translators did this is because how many witnesses are there? Two witnesses. So when describing the two witnesses, it's saying their mouth, their testimony, their prophecy. But actually in the Greek, it's in the singular. So it's actually one mouth, 
one prophecy, and one testimony. So it's two witnesses, but they have the same message, using the same mouth, same prophecy, same testimony. This is really big in trying to understand what the two witnesses are. Okay, so you're seeing this again. I want to make sure you see this. Two witnesses, but it has one message. Two witnesses, one prophecy. Two witnesses, but one testimony. Okay, let's keep going. So are there any places in Scripture where two people are identified together with one message? Well, yeah, sure. Joshua and Zerubbabel. Remember, Joshua and Zerubbabel, Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel were responsible for the rebuilding of the temple after Solomon's temple was destroyed, after returning from exile. But are we going to then resurrect Joshua and Zerubbabel during papal supremacy? No, that becomes kind of problematic, don't you think? Because we don't have any history of guys showing back up. Moses and Aaron, two guys, one message, right? So the Lord said to Moses, see, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, shall be your prophet. Two men, one message. But again, past, during the 1260 years, do we find any place where Moses and Aaron are being resurrected? No. We also have Elijah and Elisha, right? Elijah dies. Well, he doesn't really die. He goes to heaven, and Elisha says, I want a double portion of what he had, which is a double portion of the what? Of the Spirit. Two guys, still one message. But again, did Moses or did Elisha and Elijah resurrect? You know, today, the, even Jews, if you didn't know this, when they set the table, they actually leave an empty seat because they're hoping for the coming back of Elijah. Remember when Jesus was here and uh, John the Baptist was baptizing? What was that they thought that he was? They thought he was Elijah. Okay, they're still waiting for Elijah, but the reality is. Elijah and Elisha were not resurrected during the 1260-year period. What about Moses and Elijah? Moses and Elijah both talked to God on Mount Sinai. Both met Jesus at his transfiguration. But again, am I going to find either of them being resurrected during this period? So I can certainly learn from their message. I can study what they had to say and then look at the two witnesses and go, I wonder if the message of these men is similar to the message of the two witnesses. But outside of that, I'm not going to resurrect these guys and place them during this 1260-year period. There's also some interesting parallels that you find in the two witnesses and the ministry of Jesus. Jesus was here on the earth for how many years? Interesting. Those three and a half years when he did his ministry after his baptism, right? Three and a half years. Fascinating. Public ministry. The two witnesses we're going to see are going to die. Did Jesus die? Yeah. We're going to find the two witnesses are resurrected. Did Jesus resurrect? We have the two witnesses ascending to heaven. Did Jesus also ascend to heaven? So there's some interesting parallels there. It says the two witnesses are going to stand before God. Did Jesus also go to heaven before the Father? Right? He says, I sit at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Yeah, absolutely. They are both clothed in sackcloth, which is a reminder of Jesus on earth with, when his divinity was veiled. So you have some interesting parallels with Jesus' ministry and the two witnesses' ministry. We have interesting parallels between some of these men of the Old Testament, but again, it's their message, not them individually, and the message of the two witnesses. Verse 7, verse 8, this is also really important. Because again, where are we placing the two witnesses? What period of time? The 1260 years. It says that when they finish their testimony, or the testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. This is really important. People get this really confused. This does not say that this is where they are because we know that Jesus was not crucified anywhere other than in Jerusalem, right? Outside the city. So we're not going to, and that's why the word spiritually is being used here. What we're going to look at here in just a minute, what was the spiritual condition in Sodom? What was the spiritual condition in Egypt? 
Okay, we're going to look at that. But we want to look at this here, a beast. When we looked at Daniel chapter 7, and we looked at Revelation chapter 13, a beast represents what? A nation, an empire, a kingdom. Yeah. So we're looking for a kingdom. We're looking for a nation. We're looking for a power during the 1260-year period that's being, remember, if, if you remember this earlier in our series, bottomless pit just means a place of restraint. So something's being held in check, and now something is being released. What nation is being released during the 1260-year period that's making war, that's killing, that's doing all of this kind of stuff, and is presenting itself as being a good thing, but really it's not a good thing? We're going to see this here. Now, again, as I said, as Jesus was being crucified on the cross, what was the spiritual condition of the, of the people that were around that cross? Outside of John and the ladies that were there for Jesus and weeping, what was the condition of everybody else that was around that? It's probably a mixed multitude, but was there a lot of anger, a lot of wrath? Was there a lot of people making fun of him? Were there a lot of people that were, you know, chastising Jesus? Were there people saying, if you are the Christ, come down? Were there people gambling over his clothes? Were there all kinds, would you say, a lot of immorality and things that were around that? When you go to Sodom and Gomorrah, what words would you use to describe the condition morally inside Sodom and Gomorrah? Godless? Evil? What other words come to your mind? Okay, sin, anything else that you see? Sexu- the immoral sexuality that was going on there, all that stuff. What about Egypt? Now, when you think of Egypt, I'm thinking of, again, the story of the Exodus. When you go there, what was the condition of the Hebrew people in Egypt as they were living there in their slavery? What was the condition then? Do you have any words that come to mind when you think about Egypt? Oppress. The one word that I'm thinking of is idolatry, paganism, yep. Another thing that I think of is, what were the words that Pharaoh said to Moses when he came and told him about the God of heaven? What was his words back to him? Who is this? I don't know this. So what do we typically call when you reject the fact that there is a God? Atheism. So you've got atheism, because it was very polytheistic that was there in, in Egypt. So you had atheism, okay? So we're looking at a nation that fits those descriptions during this time of the 1260 years. What would that be? Again, during that time, we're having the papal inquisitions. You're having, again, as as Daniel says, you have the saints that are being persecuted. You have the saints that are being killed. You have them being tortured during all these inquisitions. Let Let me just do this. I'm going to start making a list here. And we're going to list all these different characteristics as we go through. And then we're going to say, okay, which fits all of these? Again, you find them during the wilderness period. They're connected with the woman, the church. Even though it's two witnesses, it's one mouth, one prophecy, one testimony, right? And when they finish their testimony, the beast, this nation is coming out and making war against them. To me, the only thing that fits, if you're looking at nations, is the nation of France. When you start going, and I'm not going to go through all the history with you. We've kind of looked at it throughout our series so far. Clovis was very influential, as you see here. Uh, And if you notice right there in the middle, the kingdom of the Burgundians. If you didn't know this, Clovis's wife is Burgundian. Which was interesting because the Burgundians were the ones that actually changed their mind. And actually, Clovis, if you looked at this historically, was very influential in the propagation of the Catholic faith. He ended up making much of the whole western side of the Roman Empire Catholic. And the rise of France was right in the middle of all of this. As I showed this picture early on in the series, you have Charlemagne. And as you can see there, who was crowning him? But the Pope that's crowning him king. And that's why you saw the combination of of church and state that was happening during this time, rise of France. You also have Louis the 16th. Remember his wife? What was his wife's name? Mary Antoinette. What happened to both of them? Off with their head. The guillotine was 
was the way in which they were killing a lot of people. And when you look at the history of this, it was really, it was a bloodbath of what was happening in the streets. Uh, Christians were just being killed, and they, they themselves were also uh, killed. What about Napoleon Bonaparte? Again, he was the one that was actually very influential in the overthrowing of the papacy through taking of the Pope Pius captive and the breaking up of the church and state relationship. That's what, the, again, Daniel says in Revelation. That's the deadly wound. Okay? So it's the, it's the rise of France. So this beast that rises up out of the pit is France. Let's go to verse 9 and 10. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, nations will see their dead bodies, these two witnesses, dead bodies, three and a half days, and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. My goodness, what, who is this? Who is this? So I was reading some history stuff, and I'm just going to read a little bit with you. I won't bore you too much. It says, the new Republican government, known as the Convention, responded to growing civil unrest and the ongoing overseas threats with the reign of terror. This was 1793. The Revolutionary Tribunal, established March 10, 1793, aimed to demonstrate that persons of danger to the Republic were being identified and punished. This was Christians. And if you remember early in the series, I told you that even though it was the Catholic Church that was doing this, Everyone was paying the penalty who was Christian. It was like there was an umbrella over everybody. All of Christians had to now go into their homes to worship because if they did it openly, they were identified and punished. In October 1793, public worship was forbidden. And over the next few months, all visible signs of Christianity were removed. A policy pursued with particular enthusiasm by revolutionary armies eager to seek revenge on the institution that harbored so many counter-revolutionaries. Church bells were pulled down and melted. Ostensibly, the, the help to help the war effort. Crosses were taken from churches and cemeteries and statues. Relics and works of art were seized and sometimes destroyed. With the immigration and abdication of so many priests, and the disruption of regular forms of worship, the laity had become accustomed to taking over services, even performing white masses where there was no priest available. The convention, anxious to achieve some sort of, of form of stability, recognized that somehow it would have to accommodate this private worship. It did so by announcing in February of 1795 the formal separation of church and state. Churches were reopened. Refractory priests were released from jail. Both constitutional and refractory priests were permitted to practice on the condition they were promised to respect the laws of the republic. Now remember, again, Daniel Revelation says that the wound would be healed. So much of what we're reading here that happened during this French period, especially the French Revolution, if that was then broken and it says it's going to be healed, then what would we expect to happen in our own near future? Similar things. As Sabbath keepers, as we've already seen, again, we will be the minority. And the majority will be keeping what day? Sunday. Will we be able to worship openly and freely in this sanctuary? Not if it goes based on what we see here. Because if we do, we are identified and killed or imprisoned. So this is really important. We recognize this. We learn about our own future by looking at the past. That's why I hear people all the time. It drives me crazy when they say, why do you keep referring to the Old Testament? I'm a New Testament person. I'm like, don't you realize that we can understand better our future by studying the past? We can look at what happened in the Exodus. We can look at what happened in the book of Judges where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. We can study the past to understand much of, not everything, not exactly, but we can see some brush strokes of what's going to happen in the future. It's, it's clear. Dechristianization had forced religious observance into the privacy of the home. 
With the immigration and abdication of so many priests and the disruption of regular forms of worship, the laity become accustomed, as I said, to taking over the service. And in 1795, there was a formal separation of church and state. Yet complete separation proved impossible. Religion was still considered a threat, and subsequent decrees sought to monitor worship and ban outward signs of religion, such as statues or religious dress, from the public eye. Satan is loving what he just did. Because he was the one, remember, he's the one, according to Daniel, that put the, the Catholic Church, gave its power, gave its authority, gave its, its seat. But now everybody in Christendom, not just the Catholics, everybody is suffering. Even the Reformation, those that really had the true gospel, are being affected by this. So Satan is watching the church run like a chicken with its head cut off. Because they don't know where to turn. And even if they are worshiping in their homes, do you still think that some are getting discovered? Yeah, because if someone there sees a group of people going into a home, what do they do? They tell on them. So you're not even necessarily safe in your own home. And so again, I see this as a writing on the wall that we're going to end up coming into the same kind of thing if we see a combination of church and state again, which I believe is. So after these three and a half days, even though this hardship is happening to these two witnesses, it says the breath of life from God entered them. This is a really important analogy here for a moment. They do not do it on their own. Do you understand what I'm saying here? This is a supernatural breath of life. This, is, this takes you back to the beginning when God created Adam and Eve. God formed him from the dust of the ground, breathed into him a breath of life, and he became a living being. He became a living soul. What is human beings without the spark or breath of life? We are but dirt. We are nothing. So here it's telling you the same thing. These two witnesses, once they are killed, cannot of themselves bring themselves back to life. The only way that happens is that God supernaturally intervenes and breathes back into them. As a result, they stand on their feet, and there's great fear that falls on all that see this. They can't believe that this has happened because no, it's not humanly possible. And they heard a voice from heaven saying, come up here. And the two witnesses ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. So let's look at what we've done so far. During the 1260-year period, connected with the woman, the church, their testimony torments the wicked. The dragon works through the beast from the bottomless pit to do what? To kill them. There are two witnesses, but again, it's still one mouth, one prophecy, and one testimony. Their testimony seals the servants of God. And the two witnesses die, but are supernaturally resurrected by God. Verse 13. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid. And what did they do? Gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, this is very interesting because I went, again, you, there was some seismic activity charts and things that they were doing and testing. If you remember from my series, the first night, I went back pretty early to where seismic activity was happening. We were able to trace some of those things. For instance, we know the Lisbon earthquake of 1755. But 1755 is before we're dealing with this here because, again, this is the French Revolution. We're 1790, 1780s. So it wouldn't be the Lisbon earthquake. That's going backwards. So I started doing all kinds of research. I looked and looked and looked, and I cannot find any major earthquake in history that's being described of killing 7,000 people in a tenth of the city falling. Now, you remember, throughout this entire series, I've said the book of Revelation is a symbolic book. Why do we look for literal things when maybe what he's saying here is something symbolically is happening. How is it that symbolically a city is falling? How is it symbolically that people are being killed? What is it trying to describe here? And how are they afraid? Now, here's the thing. When 9-11 hit, 
and the Twin Towers were crashed into. I think I've said this before. They say that there was an 80% increase in church attendance with 9-11, right? They were afraid. And some did give what? Glory to the God of heaven. But six to nine months later, they said those numbers went back down to normal. So was that fear one that lasted or one that only was short term? You look at Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. It seemed at times that he was fearful of the things that were happening. When his firstborn died, was he afraid? Yes, he was. He said, get out of here. I don't want you here anymore. But what happened? He changed back and chased after them to kill them. So that seems to be, again, I, I'm not, I don't know the hearts. Only God does. But it seems there are times where fear does accomplish someone giving glory to God. But the question is, is it sustainable? I don't know. Maybe in some cases it is. Maybe it's enough of a fear factor that a person does change and stays the course. But it doesn't always work that way, does it? Sometimes the fear wears off and go back to normal life and no longer bringing those things to God. So we see something going on here in this. So let's just add this to our list. The two witnesses die, they are resurrected. Some are afraid, and as a result, they are giving glory to God. But we know during this period, not everybody was changed. Not everybody was converted, okay? I want to compare these two passages. In Revelation chapter 11, we have, again, the two witnesses dying, the breath of life entering them, and them ascending to heaven. In Daniel chapter 8, when it talks about the papacy, it talks about it growing up to the host of heaven, and it casts some of the hosts and the, some of the stars where? To the ground, and did what? Trampled them. It even exalted itself as high as the what? the prince of the host. Do you see how these are opposed to each other? On one end, in Daniel chapter 8, the papacy is casting truth to the ground and exalting himself. But in reality, even though he's able to do that, in the end, the breath of life is entering them. Satan can't keep it down. And this power, these two witnesses are then ascending to heaven. This is a really important comparison that you need to look at. So in the end result, let's look at this in the end result. People can look at their world and they can see all the hardship and all the difficulty and they can say, what's the point? That's what happened to Israel. Israel, when they were wandering in the wilderness, they were saying, what's the point of, of being faithful? Look how we're living. We're, we're, we're not wealthy. We're not rich. We're nobodies. What's the point of being faithful to God? Is that a question that people say today? What's the point of following God when I'm living this way and I'm living that way and I have cancer and I have this hardship? What's the point? You know what? There is no God. That's what many people do. And, the, and Satan says that during this papacy power, it's, tra it's trashing the word of God. It's throwing things to the ground, exalting himself. But God said, in the end, all things work together for good that love God. So even though things stink now, and things are horrible in many lives, and maybe you are going through some serious tribulation in your own life, in the end, when it's all said and done, sin is going to be extinguished from the universe, you're going to be in heaven, and you're going to say to yourself, man, this is worth it, because heaven is so grand and heaven is so great. It's not great here on this earth. We understand that. And morality continues to get worse. But we can look forward to the day that we too are going to ascend to heaven and we're going to live in paradise. But this is an interesting comparison between the two witnesses and the work of the papacy. There is no other answer to this, my friends. There is no other thing that fits the bill of being the two witnesses than what? The word of God. It's not individuals. It's not people. It's the Word of God. How many Testaments are in the Word of God? Two. But does the Old Testament agree with the New Testament? One prophecy. We've done it. Daniel and Revelation. One testimony. One mouth. It's all the same. It's the Word of God, friends. And the papacy tried to distinguish the Word of God. But God has supernatural. Tell me another book that has stood the test of time. It wasn't human beings that kept it. It was that God supernaturally 
has rescued the word of God so that you and I can have access to it today. Psalm 119, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives what? Understanding to the simple. I mean, think about this. Let's put it together. Was the word of God during this 1260-year period? Yes. Were the Protestant reformers trying to increase the word of God and translate it in all different words and give it out to the common people when the Catholic Church was saying, no, this needs to be burned, this needs to be gotten rid of, the people shouldn't have access to it? Yep. Let's keep going. Is the word of God connected to the church? Yes. Does the word of God torment the wicked? Yes. Does the dragon work through the beast from the bottomless pit to destroy the word of God? We saw that. Yes. Does the word of God contain the Old and the New Testament, but it's still one book? Yes. Does the word of God in reading it through what it tells you, does its testimony seal the servants of God? Yep. Do, does the word of God die but is resurrected? Is it supernaturally taken care of by God? Yep. Are some people afraid of what the Word of God says? Yes. Are some, though, as a result of the Word of God, going to give glory to God because of it? Yes. Are there some people that say, I don't want to hear that. I want to remain ignorant. No, 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 don't show me those things. I want to continue to live my life. They may not say that, but there's a lot of people that I do evangelism meetings with that they hear these words, they see it on the pages, and they go, that doesn't fit into my life. My friends, the word of God is like a two-edged sword, is it not? Yep. And so we have to see this. And so then what does this mean then in verse 13? In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell, and the earthquake killed 7,000 people, and people were afraid, and, and some were giving glory to God. What would you see this in a symbolic way? What kind of earthquake is coming on the stage toward the end of the 1700s and the early 1800s, other than the Second Great Awakening. It just fits so perfectly. The Second Great Awakening, the Word of God in the early 1800s, is just exploding on the scene. you got American Bible societies that were, are reproducing the Bible in different languages, and it's going all over the planet. In 1829 alone, the Bible Society printed 360,000 English Bibles. By 1860, they were producing more than a million per year. By 1912, they were publishing Bibles in 84 languages, including those of Native American tribes. Again, that was God's supernatural intervention. Because if God didn't, Satan would have extinguished the Word of God. Satan was extinguishing those that were preaching the Word of God over and over and over again. And it, let me tell you something. You think God is having to intervene in our lives today? You think Satan continues to try to silence us, to get rid of us? If you pull back the curtains, I believe there's a battle waging. And many of us have many angels that are fighting for us. You think we need to be praying every day, Lord, please fight this battle for me. I can't do it on my own. And maybe I need more than one angel. If Satan recognizes what's going on here, is he going to send a legion of angels? So we need a legion of God's angels. I mean, there is a battle waging all around us, friends. It is. And I believe, and if you believe, that history is going to repeat itself. And we're going to see that even if I stand before magistrates, even if I stand in the court and I open up the word of God, it will be like, I don't want to hear that. That is not the law of this land. This is not what we believe. You can go ahead and just get rid of that. We have no time for that. And that's where we're headed, friends. When we see the church and state, it's going to sound good because it, right now the Pope is talking about unifying the world and putting us all under the same banner. And many people think that sounds great. But if you read Revelation chapter 13, friends, it is not a good situation. Because do you want the Catholic Church leading the way? Even though Protestant churches are coming in and, and grasping hands, do you want that? to be the reality, especially when it says that Satan sits on the throne, gave him his authority, gave him every, all of these things, and Satan is the puppeteer that's controlling all this? No, it's not. And so it's dangerous times of which we are leading, we're coming into. Do you think we need to have a life that's built on God's word? Yes. I think there is no doubt in my mind that those two witnesses represent the word of God. And I feel sad that so many today 
in so many different churches. Remember, the, the seven churches is for us, and it says, you're doing some good things, but I have these things against you. One of them is, even the church of Ephesus, as strong as that church is, he says, you've lost the love you had at first. And my friends, we're living in a day that we need to regain our love for the Word of God. Because the Word of God is what changes us. I said this morning in Sabbath school, I said, the only thing that we take with us to heaven is our character. And our character is developed by beholding, we become changed. And we need to slow down and read the Word of God. Look at these words. Think about these words. Examine these words. And allow the Word of God to saturate inside of our bodies so that we become the people that God knows that we can be. Amen? I want to be the person like Jesus, like we said this morning, where he comes to the, to the garden and he's praying. And he says, not my will, but yours. Isn't that the greatest battle that you and I are in, is ourselves? What an incredible prayer that Jesus leads us in and says, you know what? I don't want my will, Lord. I want your will. And I pray that is our reality, not just today, but until our final breath, that we be our people of the word, we're built on the Word of God. We study the Word of God. Never thinking that I've arrived or I have it all. But like Delon said this morning, he's been to meetings this many times, and every time he comes, he learns something new. That's what the Word of God does. And I believe that even when we get to heaven, God's going to open up the Bible to us, and he's going to say, did you see this? And I'm going to be like, I never even saw that. And we're going to continue to look at all the scriptures that God has put in there. We're going to continue to learn for all of eternity. Amen? Amen. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this truth, that these two witnesses represent your word, Old and New Testament, but they are still one mouth, one voice, one testimony, one prophecy. We're not just New Testament people, we're all Testament people. Everything is in agreement because it was the same spirit that spoke through each of those individuals from Genesis to Revelation. And we know, as we said, that by beholding, we become changed. So help us to be people of the word. If you supernaturally intervened to bring back the Word of God, to keep it in our grasp and within our reach, then there is reason for it, providential reason for it. Help that book not to be something that's sitting on our shelf collecting dust, but we are opening it every, every day. We are thinking about it, looking at every word, praying about it asking for you to teach us something new from its pages this day, to reinforce within us that we can trust you, to reinforce that, that you will lead us, that you will provide for us, that you will shelter us, that you do all these things for us. Why? Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I believe, Lord, that's what you want. You want each of us to be there to embrace you in the kingdom of heaven. Help us to fight back against the devil to open up the pages of this book and behold it and become changed. Again, we love you so very much. Be with us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.